Gracious God, speak through our words and work through our deeds when they are worthy, and when they are not, speak and work in spite of them. Amen. Amen. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. So I'm going on record here. You may quote me and you can text and tattle the bishop all you want, but I'm telling you the truth as far as I know it. Thomas was the first Anglican. How do I know? Well, I say it's self-evident in the text. You see, Thomas, like many Anglicans, was skeptical of eyewitness accounts that were not his own. And Thomas, like many Anglicans, was deliberate and inseparable, inseparable from his deliberateness, inseparable from his questioning. Thomas was also faithful. His skepticism in no way reflected a lesser faith. Contrary to what we often hear about this passage, I confess, contrary to what I have preached in the past about this passage, I think Thomas simply reflected the foundation of faithful theology. Because for my money, theology isn't understanding, seeking faith. Thomas had a deep faith that was seeking understanding. And so Canterbury House and Trinity Episcopal Church, and indeed the whole Episcopal Church, I think even the larger Anglican communion, for the most part, we can all resonate with this saying, we prefer questions that cannot be answered to answers that cannot be questioned. And so I resubmit to you, Thomas was the first Anglican. Now he gets a bad rap, Thomas does. I mean, he's got that nickname, Doubting Thomas. And I think in some corners of the larger church, not just the Anglican, but the larger church culture, I think some people view that Doubting Thomas nickname as somewhat condescending, and I think that's what is intended. I think the implication is that Thomas doubted because he had a weak faith. Well, first I wanna dispense with the notion that weak is a flaw in the kingdom of God. Lest we forget, St. Paul said in reference to his faith in Jesus Christ, therefore I am content with weaknesses for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I further contend that Jesus himself displayed what the world considers weakness. He allowed himself without retaliation or without defense to be abused, to be battered, to be killed. What omnipotent God does that? And so for my money, everything about Jesus' final days and his whole, his whole life demonstrates the opposite of what any stereotypical red-blooded American would ostensibly demonstrate when faced with harm from a so-called enemy. Jesus showed the very opposite of self-defense. He showed the very opposite of stand your ground. He showed the very opposite of death before dishonor. Secondly, I suspect that many Anglicans and academics believe that the most solid faith you can have is the faith that is examined by your own and others skepticism, even a faith that has been battered by doubt, sort of a theological iron sharpening iron. So let's put ourselves in the story, or as they say, dig, if you will, the picture of this really improbable sounding event. Jesus shows up unannounced at his own shiva. And then he says, peace be upon you, which given the circumstances is the biblical version of boo. And then uninvited, clearly ignoring COVID protocols, Jesus blows on them and says, here's the Holy Spirit. So I'm Thomas and I walk in after this and Jesus has taken off. I didn't know he was there. And everybody's just sitting around and one of them says, oh, hey, Tom, not like Tom, Jesus, who has died, he was just here and he blew on us and gave us the power to forgive sins. Uh, right, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying that on sale. I mean, doesn't everybody by now know that old, while you were away, God showed up and blew on us and now we can forgive sins trick? So yeah, you're gonna have to convince me. I had to see and touch him myself. So when I look at it like that, I find Thomas to be something of a regular guy who knows better than to take something like that for bonded truth. 
but he gets the bad rap. He gets that condescending doubting Thomas title. And we hear sermons on how we should not be like Thomas because Thomas was showing just how little faith he had. And I confess again, I have preached that, but I no longer believe it. Thomas gets a bad rap, but lest you and I forget, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. To me, the enemy of trust is the guarantee. Frederick Beekner said, doubt is the ants in the pants of faith. And so let's also remember that Thomas was not the first person to doubt these important events. If you recall, Mary Magdalene and the other female disciples came and ran and told Peter and them, Christ is risen. Well, Peter and the rest of them no more believed the women than had they said the moon is made of green cheese. So let's dispense with the idea that true believers believe instantaneously. Let's dispense with the idea that doubt is a bad thing. Again, I think Thomas was the first Anglican. I think it's safe to say that we doubt or we question because our faith is deeply important to us. We question because we stake our lives on the gospel. Somewhere in there, we know that the ultimate issue in our faith does not fall into the realm of cognitive assent. The ultimate issue on our faith does not fall into the realm of scientific replicability. We question, we question because faith isn't what we think. Faith is how we live. And so you and I have this both power and responsibility um, to one another and to God and to ourselves and to the whole of creation. I mean, Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit onto us just as much as he breathed it onto the disciples. And he said, what you do in life weighs heavily in heaven. What you let go of as my disciples is gone. But the grudges and resentments you carry, well, they stay. And they stay and they cause you and everyone else all the harm that you can imagine. What we do is important to God. What we do, whether it's selfless or selfish or in the middle of self-caring, those things have impact and they're important. Which means let's not relinquish the power that we have. Let's not abdicate our power, our authority. Let's take it on slowly and deliberately like Thomas did. I think a benefit of having power or, or uh, I think a responsibility of having power is to be deliberate about what you do with it. But we are given power and authority at times for a reason, and God takes no delight in our shrinking back. I believe God says to us, I made you exactly who you are, and I am growing you into who you are becoming, exactly so that you can make the kingdom of God a reality on earth. I think God says to us, I made you to build your part of the kingdom. You cannot do that not being you. You can't do that shrinking back. You can't build your part of the kingdom abdicating your power. So let's let Thomas be Thomas. And let's remember, or at least be open to the possibility that skepticism is not weak faith. Let's live into the reality that weak by human standards is not weak to God. Let's pray. Beautiful God, guide us to faithful doubt and deliberateness as we do your work in this world. Amen.